first of our seminars in this uh, semester on um, ECP issues and ECP practice, if I can just very broadly describe it. And uh, I'm very pleased to kick off the, uh, the seminars with uh, Dale Taylor from UCT. But uh, before I tell you more about her, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Mkwambakana from uh, Mamalodi campus. She's laughing because I always trip over her name. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I think better known as Janine. And I will hang on hand and, and, and ask her to welcome you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prof. Rolnik. Um, Dear deans, deputy deans, academics, and support staff from various faculty of University of Pretoria, it sounds political now, so <laughs> I need to do the welcoming <laughs> protocol observes. Um, and our uh, Madam Speaker of the day, Professor De uh, Taylor, on behalf of Prof. Uh, Mukalakala uh, Freshman, uh, you are welcome to this our first uh, seminar of the series of many to come. Um, uh, to come on an, and the ECPs at UP. As you know, ECPs at UP are at a crossroad because we need to turn around what we've been doing. And um, maybe a little bit of history. Our programs, the two put of us, they've been very low for many years. And the uh, executive took the decision that we need to change whatever we've been doing and reinvent ourselves. Otherwise, the, the most um, extreme decision was to close because it became it, it appeared to be a very expensive program. So um, last year, before the end of the the, 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 the the end of the second semester, we took the, uh, the, the, the director and myself to visit a couple of universities for benchmarking mm. exercise. Uh, we had um, a report that we tabled at um, our interfaculty meetings, and people took a note of that. We do work closely with the Faculty of Science, Natural and Agricultural Science, the Faculty of Economic and Management Science, and now also special links with humanities. And with the, the, the deans and the deputy deans teaching and learning of those faculties, they took in their hands to revisit the offerings at Mamelodi in the extended curriculum programs. Then there are many teams, committees, subcommittees that are in, that are formed and will be formed so that we can see how our offering are. Can we restructure? Can we change? What are we changing? What will be the model we need to choose? And this uh, this first talk here is so important for us. Only yesterday we received invitation for a special team that has been formed so that we can look into the NAS programs and decide which programs are we going to carry on with going forward and uh, can we change and what are we going to change. So we look forward to your speak, madam, <laughs> so that we can see what we can learn from you and import in the revision that we are embarking on. So it's very important that we understand so that we, do, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. If there are programs that are working elsewhere in our sister's universities, we can learn from, import, and in, uh, implement in our own programs, the, the existing one. So we look forward to learn from UCT today and how we can implement or take forward the discussion in our subcommittees as we embark in this journey of revising uh, our current existing program. So we have a mammoth task in front of us mm -hmm. and we need all the um, the help, all the evidence that exists already because isn't the funding comes from the same body. So it will be important that, that we can use the same picture, the same offering system that is allowed and approved by the government. So uh, thank you, um, uh, Prof. Rolnik, for organizing this first seminar. There are many more to come. The invitation will go out uh, in due time. And if anybody around here has also input, input that can add value to the discussion on the table at my melody with the faculties that we work with, you are more than welcome to contact Prof. Rolnik. So I will end up by 
uh, wishing all the women in the, this mm -hmm. on this platform. Today is uh, it's International Women's Day. What is the old that is a woman talking to the mostly women in the, the room? Both Angu and other colleagues, both of us say, I didn't ignore you, but it's a special day for women. I'll stop there by saying Happy Women's Day to all the ladies. And let's hear from you. And I'm quite interested in uh, the discussion that will uh, unfold from your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I might disappear at one moment because I was in another meeting. So, but you are very welcome. And we look forward to sharing your experience from your university. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you thank very you. much, Janine. Um, uh, I've just, just remains for me to give you a little bit of a background on Dale. There was something in the flyer that went out. Uh, I have to say that what I can say, a lot of what I can say is from personal experience. Uh, Dale was a colleague of mine in the Witt School of Education. And besides being an excellent physics teacher, she has in the past, uh, since 2011, is that long ago she met, she left us, she's been in the physics department at UCT, teaching on uh, the UCT version of the extended program. And she's got very involved in the last 11, 12 years in the um, extended curriculum program. She's now Deputy Dean for Teaching and Learning at UCT's Center for Higher Education Development, which is actually a faculty that oversees all the extended programs in the university. Um, she's been head of the Science Faculty's Academic Development Unit, and uh, I also know her research quite well, but I won't uh, get into that right now. Let's just hear what she's got to say. She's going to talk to us for about 35 to 40 minutes, and hopefully then we'll have some time for questions. Over to you, Dale. That's super, thank you. Can you see my slides there? I can. Super, all right, good. Um, so thank you for having me here today. Um, and I'm going to be sharing you, with you what we do at UCT. We certainly haven't got it all figured out. Uh, I'll share, share with you some of the ways in which we don't have it all figured out. Um, but hopefully the diversity of what we do at UCT, because I think across the faculties we, we implement every possible version um, of ECP models. Um, hopefully that will provide some imagination perhaps of what might be possible. Um, and also some some pitfalls that maybe you can avoid. Um, so I think most people in the room there are aware that the the attraction of ECPs is that you get extra money from the government um, in addition to the regular block grant. Um, however, there's no additional funding provided for non-ECP students who attend ECP courses, and I'll explain why that's relevant um, coming up. There is a proposal for a new foundation model which would be a little bit more uh, nuanced, um, it's been sitting on hold for years now. Um, I'm not sure, sure what's what's going to come of it, um, but just to to mention that. Um, so not everybody in the room will know that there are different kinds of courses that are counted um, that that count towards this foundation grant. Um, there's the fully foundational course um, that uh, is where it's stuff that's not included in first year courses. So it's a bridging between school and, and university material that's not covered in other um, sort of mainstream courses. Then there are extended courses which cover the same as an equivalent non-extended course, um, but they also give extra foundational material so that overall they take twice as long. Um, there's an augmented course that does the same sort of thing, but instead of taking twice as long, they take twice as much time in the, in the curriculum. So they um, take double the normal amount of timetable time. And then there are also augmenting courses uh, where students attend the regular course, but plus at least um, some extra material, um, which carries a separate course code. Okay. Um, I'm going to invite you just to interrupt, put your hands up, Marissa's keeping an eye there. Um, if there's anything you want to, anything I say that's not clear and needs to be clarified for, for what I'm saying to make sense. So feel free to interrupt. Okay. Um, so <laughs> this is the diversity of what we've got at UCT. Um, so firstly, we can differentiate between access models and transfer models. Um, so access models are where students um, are placed in the ECP from the get-go. 
um, and that's based on their um, matric and NBT results, some combination of those, um, and they're placed from the start in, in the extended courses. Um, and then there are transfer models where students all start out together um, and then based on their performance, they get transferred to, to the extended models, okay, the extended curricula. So the access models, um, in humanities, what we've got is a mixture of some foundational courses. So there's a writing course and there's also a numeracy course for students that are going to need that for psychology. Um, and students are advised whether they need to do those courses or not based on, on metric marks. And then in addition, they've got augmenting courses where the students register for the non-extended course, um, but then they have to do additional tutorials, um, very organized tutorial program that we've got, um, lots of training of tutors that goes with that, and those are called the plus tuts. Um, so students will register for, say, Psychology 1, but they'll also register for the plus tut for Psychology 1, if that is indicated as needed. Um, Commerce has a range of extended courses. Then in terms of the transfer models, there are also differences in how those operate. So the health sciences let students run for a whole semester and then based on their results at the end of that semester, um, they then transfer them to their intervention program. That used to run for a whole year. Uh, for the last two years, it's only running from July to November. And then what happens now is then students get um, placed back into the first year course uh, with the incoming a new cohort of students. So they, they, there's no ghettoization of them. They, they um, don't come late into that first year course, which is what happened previously. That's a problem in terms of funding. Um, our new model doesn't attract foundation funding. Um, and yeah, we may, may be crazy to have done it, um, but that's what's happening. Um, with science and engineering, the students transfer after the first test. So after four weeks of lectures, um, we let students write tests. We have two special test days uh, with their no lectures. Um, and then based on those, the results of those tests, they then transfer into the extended courses from the beginning of term two. Um, the reasons for doing that is that there are many factors that affect how students do at university. And it's not only the incoming um, abilities as measured imperfectly by the NBT and the um, NSC results, but it's also issues of how they transition into university, um, how they manage the culture shock that many students experience, um, how they manage the sudden um, transition from, well, as, as one of our senior students put it, the good news is that no one tells you what to do, but the, that's also the bad news. Um, so there's complete freedom, um, nobody chasing after them. Um, and then also the, the fact that learning at university is is different. Um, it's it's packaged differently and the, the nature of how one has to go about the learning is different. Okay. Um, I've also added there that science from this year also has an augmenting maths course. Um, so we have uh, augmented maths courses. We also have an augmenting one um, with extra tutorials added on to the to the non 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 ECP course. Okay. All right. Any questions immediately about those? Okay. Let me continue then. Um, we also have various hybrid models um, that operate. Um, so the humanities have now got a suite of what they're calling their Kanyisa courses. Um, which are offered to non-ECP students, but bring in uh, the kind of ECP teaching um, into those courses. Commerce um, have three options. There are students on the ECP, but there are also students on what they've called an augmented curriculum. Um, and again, that doesn't attract funding, but, but it's working for a lot of students. Um, so taking, it's a, I think it's a five year or four or five, it's an extra year of the curriculum, um, but with, with extra support, again, not attracting subsidy. Um, in science, the extended courses are available to all students, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of what's available at UCT, where I'm sitting there in the science faculty, um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we've done there and some of the lessons we've learned. Um, so we only have extended courses available in five subjects. 
Um, and in fact, for the maths, it's only the, the, the maths courses for people who are planning to do the mathematical sciences, maths um, or physics or astrophysics. And there's a different maths for people who are planning to major in biology um, or computer science, um, and those don't have extended options. Um, and you'll see as well that um, in some cases it's just one extended course, um, and in some cases it's two extended courses. So for, for chemistry, uh, for, in fact for maths, chemistry and computer science, there are extended courses that run over two years in total, um, but for physics and biology, only one extended course. For biology, it's the cell biology that gets extended. There isn't a need for the other um, biology course, which is a, um, a kind of system, uh, ecosystems and form and function biology uh, that students find easier. Um, and in physics, it's just the first semester course that gets extended. I'll explain in a moment then what happens after that. Um, the interesting thing, and this is um, particularly why the hybrid models are possibly full, is that taking an extended course doesn't necessarily extend the degree length. Um, in biology, what happens is that students can take that second semester ecosystems form and function course alongside the extended course um, for the first semester course. And so they're able to start biology two courses from their second year. Um, also, obviously not if it is an elective, something that's not required for the majors. Um, and even if the course is a requirement of the major, if it's not actually the major subject, so for example, students need maths in order to do chemistry, um, but it's uh, but they can carry on with chemistry too while finishing off the extended maths. Um, and that's possible because it's possible for students to do, instead of doing four, three, two courses, they can do three courses in their first year, three in their second year, three in their third year. It is possible within the degree rules so they can catch up the um, extra extra courses in their final year. OK, whoopsie, sorry. Oh, I've just shot to the end of this. That's no good, sorry. Somehow I had something that took me to the very end of this PowerPoint. I want to be there, sorry. OK, there we go. All right. Um, so, yeah, I think I can skip over that because I've said what's there. Um, so this is just drilling in a little bit in terms of what happens with the maths and the physics. Um, so well, with the... Do you want to put it into show? I beg your pardon? Do you want to put the PowerPoint into show? Yes, I thought it is. Is it not? No. So it's not... Maybe it's, it's the wrong playing. screen. Okay. If I do that, wrong screen. Okay, I better just stop a share and then start again. Oh dear, sorry. Okay. OK, does that do it? It's not showing yet. OK, that's right. OK, but all right, sorry. Okay. Now we've got a table. Yes, the table's what I want. Table's okay. what I want. OK, cool. Um, so this is just a little bit of detail. So with the maths first year course, the first year for people planning to major in maths or physics, etc., um, they've got the option of the extended course or the augmenting courses that have two mathematical thinking workshops per week in addition to the normal tutorials. Um, and that's because we've identified that the problem with um, uh, with students not managing with the maths first year and then more especially when they carry on with maths um, is that they, they've come with this very algorithmic sort of approach to maths from school um, and they don't have the mathematical thinking. Um, that, that that they actually need. Um, so those workshops are running. It's an experiment this year. <laughs> you can ask us at the end of the year how it went. Um, then in terms of the physics at the bottom of the screen there, what happens with the um, physics course is that it's much like the uh, health sciences option where students take the extended course in their first year, but then go back into the physics for majors course in their second year. Um, so starting with that new cohort of students. But so, the interesting uh, thing is they risk. Yeah. A question from Gideon Brits. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Gideon. No, sorry. I hit the wrong button myself. I, I have no question at this stage. <laughs> okay, all right, thanks. Good. Um, 
we give students credit for both courses. So they get one and a half courses worth of first year physics credit. Um, and that's because the, the physics 1023 course, the extended course is kind of like a college physics course, uh, whereas this is like a university physics course. If you're in physics, you'll know the difference between those. The first is kind of calculus light, um, and then this, the, the um, physics 1004 course is, is calculus heavy. Okay. Um, all right, let me move on from that. So we had a formal review of our science extended degree program, um, and there was a re external review panel, people from different institutions, um, and they made a number of recommendations in regard to the structure and, um, and implementation of our curriculum. Um, and I've put those recommendations in summary up there. Um, the first was they just, uh, having interviewed people decided that there wasn't a faculty-wide understanding on the purpose of our extended degree program um, and the roles that both it and the mainstream courses play in enabling student access and success. So we've done some work in that. Um, the second problem <laughs> we haven't entirely solved, but the problem essentially that students go from doing extended courses or we're doing first year courses at half pace with extra support for their first two years into doing level two courses at full pace with no extra support in their third year and they often fall off the cliff at that point and fail and therefore end up not taking four years but five years for their degree. Um, so we've solved the problem in terms of biology, the courses in the ver various majors that there are in the biological sciences by allowing students to move to biology two courses from their second year. And often what they do is they start biology two or second year courses in their one major in second year and then their other major in their third year. Um, and then also this new maths model um, will allow students to get going with maths two um, in their second year. Um, and then they can follow up with, for example, the physics two in their third year, which also solves the worldwide problem that there is in terms of uh, students need maths in physics before they've actually done it in maths. So they'll finish maths two before they start in physics two and they'll have all the vector calculus, et cetera, that they need for uh, second year electromagnetism and the like. Okay. Um, there was also criticism of our transfer process. Um, and I'll talk a little about about how we've addressed that. Um, and that's really what uh, the last two bullets are about, um, is, is the transfer process. OK, um, so, so one of the issues that we've got um, is that our transfer processes, we give this, we've, up until now, we've given the students advice as to what we think their curriculum should be, but students still have the last say. Um, that's given students a greater sense of agency. It's detracted from the stigmatism associated with ECP courses, but it's also meant that a lot of students don't take the advice that's given to them, um, and, and that's not good. Um, so we need to do a good job of selling the extended courses. So I'm going to give you some of the slides that I've used in orientation to sell the extended courses. Um, the fact that they don't cost any more, but if you go failing the course, you can um, have to pay double. Of course, a lot a lot of our students, 45% are on uh, uh, bursaries and as fast or other, they're on financial aid. So that doesn't really apply to them. Um, but what's also attractive is that you get higher marks for the same content because generally students perform better in the extended courses, even though the exams are at the same level as the, as the non-extended courses. Um, yeah. The question, of course, of how long does a BSc take? Um, and I point out that actually we do badly with our BSc. Only 34% um, of the students that enter the BSc actually finish in three years. Another 20% finish in three to four years, regardless. Uh, well, uh, or, but sorry, tw another 20%, so 54% in total, finish in three to four years. So that another 20% finish in four years, whether they go the extended route or not. Um, we've got some 15% that get excluded and then the rest take longer. Um, there's also the thing that NISFAS funding, you get four years, but it's possible to get five years. And I'd say, hang on and I'll tell you how that is. We point out that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter um, how long your degree takes. What employers are really interested in is the kind of marks that students get. And also that determines whether you can get into honors programs or not. Um, and there are many reasons for taking longer, not just 
because you you need more um, more foundational material, um, and that helps to to reduce the the stigma of it as well. Um, yeah, um, so we kind of don't have the we've kind of shifted the the dialogue from being about or shifted the discourse from about extended courses being for students who are struggling to being extended courses are there to help you cope with a challenging BSc. Um, and so we say to students, what's your ideal curriculum pathway? And of course, the hybrid curriculum is very, very attractive um, because suppose they've got a, the, the required 60% for physical sciences, but their chemistry is much better than their physics. Um, so they maybe want to take the non-extended course for chemistry and the extended course for physics. Um, or maybe they don't have any coding experience, so you want to take the extended computer science course, but the rest not. Um, and then the attraction of, of being on the extended course. Um, so we classify students as being on our ECP if they take two or more of the extended courses in their first year. Uh, that means they're likely to take at least three extended courses overall, which is enough to kind of just meet the, the DHIT funding requirements. Um, and so if they take two or more extended courses, then their degree code changes to the ECP um, extended course. Um, and of course, that also gives them the benefit, apart from the NISFAS funding of an extra year residence and easier readmission requirements. So they set the bar a, a little lower for themselves. Um, so that's how we market it to our first years. Um, yeah, it's important to notice that part of this picture is that the NISFAS rules changed from last year, that instead of just having to pass 50% um, of courses, students now have to pass a higher percentage. It depends, of course, of the number of courses that they take. Um, but it's kind of looking at often um, two thirds um, of their courses that need to be passed. Um, yeah, so some changes that we've made to our um, program as a result of the review that have changes that have happened um, last year and this year. Um, so I've already mentioned that we've changed how we communicate about the EDP um, to being a shift from failing students to a challenging BSc curriculum, which it certainly is. And part of the challenge challenge is at, B, at UCT, we have very short, ridiculously short semesters. They're only 12 week semesters um, with a week's break in the middle. Um, and yeah, that means that students just don't have time to, to kind of catch up. Um, we've changed the transfer process. Um, from last year, we also looked at the NBT and NAC marks to inform the advice we give students. And instead of it being an opt in system where they had to see a student advisor to opt into the extended courses, we've now made it an opt out system where they're automatically transferred into the extended courses unless they see a student advisor and argue their case otherwise. Um, and then, of course, we've made changes to what used to be MAM 1000. It's now changed into semesterized courses with the introduction of an augmenting maths option um, that I've already mentioned. And then I've failed to mention that, in fact, we've placed students into the extended um, course from the beginning of the academic year. Um, and that's because we can predict from students um, in B NSC maths marks um, pretty well how they're going to do unlike um, physics and chemistry, where they come with this combined mark, and we don't know how to how really to make sense of it. Um, yeah, I think that's actually probably enough, and I should stop there. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so I've taken a bit less time than I anticipated, but hopefully that will be filled in with um, discussion. Okay. So, Yes. Thank you very much for that. Um, you do. You have indeed left a decent amount of time for discussion, which I think is quite valuable. I just want to mention one thing about Pretoria that took me a while to catch on to, and that is Pretoria University operates on a module system, which is semesterized. So a lot of the time, people ne almost never use the word course at UP. They talk of modules because the degree is an assembly of modules, which makes a much bigger combination of things that students do to create their curricula and how they step from one module to another. So uh, just so that you understand the questions better, I thought I'd better tell you that. What I'd also like to do is um, just uh, 
welcome uh, Professor uh, Mukhalakala Schleichman, who's the director of the Mamalodi and uh, the overseer of everything that happens on Mamalodi campus. She joined us late from a meeting. So I'm going to open up to the um, uh, to the guests and uh, um, Dr. Mukhalakala, if you'd like to uh, start by saying something or would you like to just leave it open for questions? Thank you, um, uh, Marissa, and uh, thank you, uh, Professor Taylor, uh, for that uh, overview of the uh, extended curriculum programs that um, uh, um, UCT offers and the different models. It's uh, actually quite enlightening. We, re we did visit uh, UCT and did um, some benchmarking um, okay. with, the, with the EMS and with the engineering, but I think you are also now, um, you know, like... Um, uh, giving us insight into the different um, uh, um, options that uh, that you have, and as Janine said, we are undergoing um, you know a process where we are reviewing our current um, extended curriculum programs, and also I think the one of the things that um, also will influence where we end up or what kind of uh, uh, structures we end up with is the uh, NEFSA's funding of the N plus one. You know, it really does have a very big impact. So whatever we do, you know, we always have to take into consideration that we don't want to disadvantage our students, but more so also we want to ensure that students complete on time and that, um, you know, we do not compromise on, you know, the, the, the quality of the curriculum. And also that we ensure that the 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 the, um, the curriculum you know really builds up to you know that outcomes that we look for once the student is a, 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 a when they graduate that because they are from an ECP they they cannot lack what a student went through a mainstream program a, a has so it's quite enlightening um, what you have uh, presented to us it opens up other opportunities marissa that we did not have uh, we were not privy to yes and yes um also i see colleagues uh, from nas and also from ems have joined us and i think perhaps for them some of them might be seeing this for the first time and maybe uh, they uh, will have more questions uh, for you and really thank you very much and thank you colleagues uh, for joining I see we are here in numbers and uh, this is all our project. It's not a Mamelodi campus project. Uh, this is for, you know, for the good of the university and also but for the good of um, the uh, our students. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ntebocheng. Um, I'm now opening up to people who have questions. Uh, Tulani. This is from physics, by the way, Dale. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but my question Tulani. Was yeah, afternoon. Uh, can, can you just highlight something on how you select the students to the ECPs? Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't put that into into detail. Um, so in science, what we do is in each of the first tests that they write, um, we decide on what we think is an appropriate cut off mark. Okay. So, for example, in physics, we use forty five percent. Um, and if students get below 45%, we, we advise them to transfer into to the extended course. Um, sometimes it's a, it can be more than uh, it can be more than 50%, even 55%. Then what we did into, to take NBT and NSC marks into account, um, because we felt that there were some students who come in who are not adequately prepared, um, haven't come from the best schools. Um, but they were kind of slipping through and just managing to pass the, those first tests um, and then not getting the, re the support, the extra support that they really needed to thri thrive at university. They're kind of just surviving. Um, what we did is those students, so we, so we used the NSC and the NBT marks to identify students in the lowest quartile. So students with whose marks fall into the lowest quartile. Um, and then those marks, those students, we set the cutoff marks 10% high. So for physics, for example, instead of it being 45%, if they got less than 55%, we would advise them to transfer into the extended courses. Um, and so what each student then gets is an individualized email from a mail merge that says, you know, well done on making it through your first term of university. Um, 
based on your first term marks, we think that this is the ideal curriculum for you. Um, and we, yeah. And that comes off a spreadsheet. And then we just, um, if students change their minds, we update the spreadsheet and, and then um, the transfers are made, the, bad, the changes on the system are made. Um, so we then have a day, um, the last day of term, where students can come um, into one venue and consult with our student advisors. Um, and there are 15 student advisors in the science faculty specializing in the different subjects. Um, and so students get to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with a student advisor, um, whether they want to transfer to the extended courses or not, but they have to speak to that student advisor if they want to not take our advice. Yeah, um, And it worked quite well last year. As I, when I looked through afterwards, there were only 12 students who were being unduly optimistic um, about, about their chances of success. Um, and of course, there's more that feeds into how they did in the first tests than just um, their, their ability. You know, there's sometimes students have had some sort of personal crisis or whatever that's adversely affected what the picture is. Um, and we also don't just look at their marks in the five subjects where there are extended courses available. We also do look at how they do in tests in the other subjects um, as far as possible. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Tulani? Yes, it does, partially. OK, <laughs> tell, me, tell, me, tell me what I haven't answered. Uh, no, can, no, we, can, can you hold it, Tulani? Because uh, let's get, uh, at least I'll come back to you, OK? Because uh, I see now Dr. Rasia Sala has a hand up. Could you like to put your question? Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the talk and for making the time. I'm currently working on a project. Um, we are trying to determine whether language at all has an influence on the academic performance of students in the science um, uh, uh, fac or science background or science faculty. Um, I'm in vacuum science. And does it actually affect Basically, your mother language, does it basically affect the way you perform when now coming from a, a basic education environment where you were you would you'd be able to get like code switching and all of that when with concepts that are difficult and then at varsity, we no longer have that and we've got a, a, a monolingual um, teaching and um, linguistic uh, um, uh, assessment style. Do you think that at all has any effect? I, I, I heard you earlier mention the many factors that influence academic success. Have you seen that? Have you maybe also looked into that? Um, and if you give any input or advice as to how I can, I, I only just recently started with the project. Um, what your thoughts are? Okay, thanks, Dr. Sala. Um, so, I mean, it's very difficult to disentangle that from. Um, uh, in terms of the racialized or the yeah the history of our of our country, um, because people who are working in second languages are also those who come from disadvantaged backgrounds by and large. Um, I so so disaggregating and and you know what are the different causes? Um, obviously, it is a, a difficulty for students for any students. I mean. We've got Afrikaans students who've come from Afrikaans schools to UCT who also fi find it difficult. I had an Afrikaans student share with our first years in orientation how in her first maths lecture she had to look up and find out what the word integer meant um, yeah. in order to actually make sense of the lecture. Um, I One of the things that we do do that I think makes a difference though is in both maths and science, um, and I think that's all, um, we have what we call whiteboard tutorials. Um, and what we have is a room full of those whiteboards on wheels, double-sided whiteboards, um, three students to a whiteboard, and we give them a sheet of problems that they've never seen before to solve, to put up solutions on the board. Um, and, and that means that often students use more than one language. Um, they use kind of translanguaging um, techniques. Um, and the... Uh, the goal of the whiteboard tutorial is not to produce correct answers, but to learn. So there are no marks given for the answers that they produce. Um, all that happens is when they get stuck or when they um, are um, have, have got to an answer, they call one of the tutors, and the tutors are diverse um, and so have multiple languages available um, to use as well, which is also helpful. Um, 
and the tutors are, can be identified in this very, very busy b venue. I mean, 120 students in, in one venue because they all wear those little yellow jackets that car guards wear and the lecturer okay. is present there as well. Um, so that provides a space where students can, can use additional languages as resource for understanding, um, which, which is helpful. Um, it's not, obviously it depends on who's in the group together, the more diverse the group, the, the less, the fewer languages are available as a resource. Um, but I will say that when we do course evaluations, students always rate our whiteboard tutorials across all our physics courses from first year to honours as being the most useful thing for, for learning physics. And we give good lectures in physics. We use lecture demonstrations, we use interactive approaches, um, but, <laughs> but the whiteboard tutorials always, always beat the lectures um, in terms of learning. So that's just kind of one strategy that helps there. Um, but yeah. I haven't really answered your question. No, no, you have to some extent. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Um, if there's no other hands up at the moment, I can go back to Tulani. You can ask the second part of your question. Yeah, there are some questions in the yeah, chat in as the well. Chat. I just noticed, I noticed one. So I think just, uh, uh, this is Talia Burke. What are the approximate numbers of students involved in main course and extended course? There are quite a few questions. And what exactly do the extended programs entail? Maths, physics specifically. Do students attend the same main course and then attend uh, additional extra sessions or is there a whole parallel course with different test exams? Pick what you like from that, Dale. There's a lot of stuff. <laughs> OK, there. super. OK, so the numbers vary a lot. Um, we've battled with take up in our chemistry course because the first term really just revises school content so students do well in the first test um, and then come unstuck at mid-year. We do allow students to do a late transfer um, at the beginning of the second semester. Um, for, yeah, so that there is that option. Um, in physics, I have anywhere between 60 and 100 students in the extended course compared with uh, sort of 250 to this year 370 um, in our physics for non-physics majors and 130 to 150 in our physics course for students who are planning to major in physics. So both of those two courses feed into my course as, as, as an extended course, yeah. Um, in maths and computer science, we also have students who are in commerce taking those courses. Um, and so those numbers tend to be large. So the first year maths, the first year maths course is about 800 students in total doing first year maths, whereas we've only got about 500 students, 550 maybe this year, doing the first year BSc. Um, so you know half the class is coming from commerce, and the same for computer science. They've got over a thousand students taking first year computer science. Um, and so those also move into the extended courses. Um, and so the extended course for, yeah, I'm not actually sure what the numbers are for maths, but it's been up to 250 students sometimes, which is really not, not helpful. It doesn't allow for that individualized support. Uh, for computer science, uh, it's 100. Yeah. Then in terms of just do the same main course and attend additional extra school sessions, I only in our math augmenting course, uh, which is one of two kind of extended um, options for math students. So math students um, being math and wanting extra support can either do a proper extended course or augmenting course and then the, the non-extended lecture, but then all that to afternoon extra so the math is double time uh, with in the um, extra workshop. And double time, part of the extra workshops have also been extra time spent on the maths. Um, and then in all the other courses, it's uh, a whole different um, it's an exactly, uh, it's just because of the timing of it. Dale, um, can you kill your camera? Because I think yeah, your, your, your reception's not good. 
that is a fire enabled dish. It doesn't look like it. Dale? I think she's she's freezing. Um, Dale, can you hear me? Um, I'm just going to try and get her on WhatsApp. Um, I'm going to try and get my give me better signal. Sorry. I think she's away. I think she's somewhere here. Uh, Maybe you can just turn your camera off. All right. Okay, would you use me? Yeah, that's a little bit better. Just um, uh, maybe just we lost you for close to a minute there, or yeah. two minutes. Um, do you want to say? I don't know where 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 we left off, but uh, Talia, okay. is th is that enough of an answer for now? Um, yes, <laughs> thank you. So we, I heard everything about the numbers of students involved. Um, I think when you started talking about exactly what the extended programs entail in terms of is it the same program or is it a completely parallel program, um, we lost you. So maybe just a very brief answer on that. Okay, all right. Sorry. Sure, with, with pleasure. So with the maths, there are two options. One is a completely different program and in program taking twice the time but now with our augmenting option which is only offered in maths they attend the non-extended lectures um, and then they um, get these mathematical thinking workshops 2 to 4 p.m monday and friday which try and help them to to get into thinking like a mathematician um, and not just being algorithmic about their maths um, so that's the only place where it's just add on extra support sessions. Everything else is a whole parallel course. And it has to be that because it's happening at half the pace. It's it's twice the length in terms of time. Uh, OK, how, how's my connectivity there? It's better than when the camera was on. It's a little bit off, but it's it's OK. We heard you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm just looking at, um, we can now, sorry, Tulani, do you want to ask your next question? Yeah, I think my, my, my second question has been answered, but uh, I would like a comment on physics. Is it the same as mathematics, where they take the same course, but with extra support? Um, no. So physics is only um, an extended option, and it's actually only an extended option of the first semester. Um, so then after that first semester, they then either take a second semester of, of kind of college, college physics, you know, for, um, physics for people who are not planning to carry on with it, um, which they do in the following year, either the first or the second semester. Um, and so it's not extended or they go back into the course that they came out of, the physics for, for people who are planning to major in physics. Uh, thank you, Dale. Um, so we've still got a few minutes left if anybody else has questions. Um, I was quite uh, interested in that quite a few of the comments you got from your review have some commonality with what uh, the extended programs and Mamalodi got uh, with their reviews, so I think they are quite common problems. The other state, the other comment I wanted to make is that you say that the throughput is 34% taking three years. Well, when I did my BSc from 1969 to 1971, it was exactly that. Yeah. One third of the students finished in three years. So I don't think it's a new thing. Um, uh, I can't remember what the percentage was that finished in four, but that's more than 50 years ago. It was 34 percent. 
So I don't know if it means we're not doing any better after 50 years or what. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, um, I mean, my answer would be that we really need to do something about the uh, the length of semesters at UCT. So in the early 2000s, when UCT changed from being, well, when higher education was restructured and UCT was designated research intensive, at that point, the semesters were cut from 14 weeks to 12 weeks. Um, and it just means that students who are more likely to have some sort of personal crisis, a death in the family, uh, uh, particularly, um, or anything else, and to experience greater culture shock um, coming to UCT, um, I just don't have time to catch up. Um, so it particularly impacts um, those kind of students, um, and it's a problem. Um, so uh, the other thing I also noticed was the high number of student advisors you have. Um, are these, when you say they know their discipline, um, that means are they are they staff members of that department? Because Pretoria tends to have professional, what they call faculty student advisors, who are not subject experts, but more likely to be career advisors, psychologists, that sort of, that sort of direction. Okay. I don't know if you'd like to comment yeah, on I that. Yeah, I can comment on that. So what we call student advisors are essentially curriculum advisors. Um, although obviously they sometimes triage student problems and, and refer them elsewhere. Um, so they're, they're experts in the curriculum. And because of the flexibility of the BSc curriculum, um, you need people um, who really know what the options are and often come up with quite creative solutions in terms of the rules uh, for students with sort of broken curricula. Um, in terms of career advice, UCT has a separate careers service uh, where students can go for consultations. Um, and they also help students who are failing to, to think about different options as well, which is useful. Um, the Student Wellness Services provides counselling, um, and then UCT does also have professional advisors, just one um, in the science faculty at this point, um, but it's growing at UCT, but we are behind the curve, um, certainly compared to, to some of the other UCT um, I mean, other South African universities in in relation to professional advising, and particularly in the science faculty, we're behind the curve. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions that anybody would like to ask? Um, I see a hand up. Um, let me find out. Uh, uh, it's uh, Joan. Is it Johan or Johan? Joan. Jo looks like Johan acronym. Go ahead. Uh, Johan, go ahead. Can you unmute? Marisa, can you also check in the chat? There might be questions as well posted yeah. in the chat. Yeah, I'm checking. Um, uh, not not at the moment. There's this one from Johan. I think it's Johan. Um, uh, you're unmuted, so talk. Because we don't hear you. I don't know what the problem is. Perhaps you'd like to put it in the chat because uh, you're not coming through. Um, while Johan is either putting in the chat or sorting out his sound problem, is there anybody else who'd like to ask a question? Um, OK, perhaps he's going to write it in the chat. Um, in the meantime, um, is there any? Oh, there's another hand up now. Um, that is Dr. Janse van Rensburg. Would you like to go ahead? Oh, the hand is down now, see. Um, Oh, there we go. We've got the question in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> Jan asked me, I wonder how the 12 week semester system works, as I believe that the 14 weeks is the norm. Yeah, it varies across the country. The, what, what, how we do it is by having five, 
five lectures a week every week for every subject in the sciences certainly um, not true in all other subjects um, yeah it's crazy but to lead into that um, I mean these top notch universities in the UK like Cambridge have three six week uh, I don't know if they call terms they call terms per year so that's an annual teaching program of 18 weeks, whereas ours between 26 and 28 weeks. So um, that's interesting. Uh, Dr. Jans van Rensburg, would you like to try now? Yes, I um, could not find my um, unmute, which was a little stupid of me. Sorry, I when we work between platforms, I forget where it is. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I, well, it actually um, slots into the previous question in terms of how you, um, the different kinds of people that are involved and um, what Marissa said about our faculty student advisors. I think that in the scenario you explained, Dale, in our in our context, you would probably then have tutors. The ideal would be to have tutors who are um, second, third, uh, maybe postgraduate students even, who would then facilitate those um, those whiteboard sessions. Um, but of course, funding is a huge problem. Um, I, it's, uh, and I'm sure you also feel, you mentioned it, you are also feeling the pressure of the um, funding becoming less and less, a small drip. Um, because I think that would be a very powerful thing for people struggling because these are students who might be able to, for example, speak the language of the student they are helping, who have experience of the, um, the subject of uh, university. Um, so yes, where do tutors feature in your system at UCT um, and how do you fund them? because we would love to know. Thank you very much, <laughs> Marissa. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Um, so the, the faculty has a big budget for tutors. So for those whiteboard tutorials, we aim at one tutor per 25 to 30 students. Um, our tutors in the BSc are mostly postgraduate students. Um, and it's understood that they, as part of their postgraduate studies, they're ex expected to enroll and, and be, be tutors. We also draw tutors from engineering, interestingly, who enjoy tutoring the first year physics. Um, it, the, it works nicely because often postgraduate students are a bit underfunded, so they get some extra um, cash there. Um, and it doesn't hurt them to stay in touch with, with the, uh, their undergraduate physics knowledge. Um, in subjects where students, where there aren't so many postgraduate students compared to the number of undergraduate students like computer science, they use third year students, final year students um, as tutors. So tutoring is a big practice across the faculty. Um, the, the tutorials aren't always those whiteboard tutorials um, with chemistry and biology. It's a tutor with a group of 20, well, actually, you know, it varies. It varies. There are bigger groups working on 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 whatever, um, given stuff to work on, and then tutor, uh, float, float, but floating tutors as well. Yeah, so I don't know how we do, I don't know how we do the maths of it, <laughs> but okay, it, it's well, a given in the science faculty. Thanks, uh, Dale. There's just an add-on by Johan who says so. You basically catch up by having more lectures per week. I don't think you do, do you? You just do. No, we do because we have. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it's not um, our, I think the content of our courses is differs a lot from institution to institution. What's considered first year at one institution might be second year at another, et cetera. Um, but we do have five lectures a week, five 45 min minute lectures a week per subject in, in the Faculty of Science. Um, and I think the norm really is four lectures per week elsewhere. Plus one touch. Plus a touch, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're just about we're just about out of time, so I'm going to say thank you very much. Uh, just uh, if if anybody saw Faith's message, uh, day uh, Somikazi day researches a lot about the use of Isik Bosa in health sciences. So she's at UCT now, so I think that was a reply. Um, and 
I would like to say thank you very much for taking time to share your work with us. And uh, I'd just like to tell you that our next um, uh, our next talk is about the 29th of March. You'll be shortly getting um, uh, a message about that. Um, I don't want to, uh, that is um, the Professor Margaret Blackie, oh, nice. who will be uh, from Rhodes, who will be talking about curriculum for knowledge building, and that will be on the 29th of March. So you're very welcome to attend that. And Dale, thank you so much. Here's our virtual bouquet of flowers to say thank you very much. Received, thank you. <laughs> and uh, goodbye, everybody, and thanks for attending. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and I wish you well um, as you rethink your ECPs. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, thanks. Thanks, Marissa. I hope that <laughs> did what so it needed to. It, it, it generated a lot of good discussions. So I remember now the whiteboard lectures. They yeah. started with Sally and Andy. 20, and, 2011 they started. Yeah. And uh, so they're still going on now. That's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And and quite big take up elsewhere in the University School of Economics. Um my molecular and cell biology for their senior courses. Yeah, yeah that's, that's interesting. That's Hope mm. to see you again soon. Yeah, indeed. Good. All right. Take care then. We'll sign off now. Thank you. Yeah, very much. good. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye.